welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We've had an amazing response to the webinar and we're really happy to have you here and also to have uh, Dr. Emile DeLang and Will Sharkey to talk about positive communication in conservation. Um, my name is Sophia castello tical I'm the Interim Director for Conservation Optimism and um, I worked with Emile and Will and a series of other co-authors to write a paper about positive communication in the biodiversity crisis. Um, so we're, today we're going to just have a short discussion about the paper, some of the key elements in it, some of our sort of key tips for how to utilize positive communication in conservation. And then we'll open up to questions from all of you, which we'd also love to hear. Um, I'll just do quick introductions. We have William Sharkey. So, well, if you could just give us a wave. Um, William Sharkey is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and the Interdisciplinary Centre for Conservation Science at the University of Oxford. His research examines community contributions to protected law area law enforcement. As part of this, he works in association with Fauna and Flora International to evaluate the impacts of a community warden patrol scheme in southwest Cambodia. And he was a co-author on this paper. Um, we also have with us Dr. Emile Delang, who is a conservation social scientist working with the Wildlife Conservation Society in Cambodia. His research focuses on how conservation can support human well-being and rights in rapidly changing rural communities. Currently, his work focuses on Red Plus programs and conservation-friendly value chains. His other interests include communications and behavioral uh, and social net communications and behavior change, social networks, and impact evaluation. A lot, a lot in there. Um, so just to kick off our discussion, I think we can start with a pretty general question. Um, what does positive communication mean to you both? Do I start? Yeah. Okay, so positive communication for me means communicating through words, sounds, images uh, that clearly describe an issue um, at hand, but also reflects reality. But I think at the same time, it offers a sense of, of efficacy so a belief that something positive is possible. Um, and it's communication that uses language and, and, and context that's appropriate to the intended audience. So it builds narratives and messages that, that motivates and empowers, um, and I think ultimately facilitates or, or tries to catalyze um, actions either individually or collectively um, that in this specific context helps to address the biodiversity crisis. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Will said. Um, I think it's about communicating in a way that enables or empowers people to take action and to act. Um, what it's not, it's not about pretending that everything is fine. Um, it's not about um, cherry picking uh, facts or statistics, but it is about helping people find ways to engage with those problems and that they can do so in a way that is positive and sustainable for them as well. So I think it's about being realistic, but also focused on actions and emphasizing uh, possibilities rather than problems. That makes sense. Um, just for sort of, um, I guess for, I'll just read out the definition that we wrote in the paper as well, just so that it kind of helps to anchor our discussion perhaps. Um, so in the paper, we define positive communication as a clear description of the issue at hand with possible paths or actions that can be taken at the individual level um, and uh, uses audience appropriate context and language while avoiding disempowering emotions. Uh, so why is positive communication important to engage people and why is it underutilized? Will, do you want to start again? Yeah, sure. Um, I think positive communications um, can help to motivate people. It can help bring people together. It can facilitate creativity um, and inspire action in the long run. Um, and these are all things that we talked about in the paper. 
Um, and I think we might get onto it a little bit later, but how it helps to mitigate and prevent disengagement and fatigue. Um, but I think, as Emil touched on earlier, the important word really is balance. And so I think communicating, we need to be communicating in, in ways that maintains that sense of, of urgency. Um, and so it's important, but, but blind optimism and false hope, the two subjects that we talk about um, and, and receive a lot of attention, um, but they can lead to, to inertia and they can enable, um, facilitate a sort of sense of doing nothing, which is, is, is not what we want. I think in the uh, in the broadest sense, I think it's important because um, it's important to keep in mind what we're working for or what, what's our objective, right? What is the world we're trying to build? And hopefully we, we're trying to work towards a world that is uh, better potentially than the world now, or at least better than uh, it could be under other scenarios. Um, so is communication that kind of uh, has a clear objective, a clear way, a path forward that we're trying to get to. Um, we don't want to make the claim that all communication should be positive. I think it's it's very important that communications are realistic. It's important that they're authentic as well. It's natural that people will feel um, a range of emotions, including sadness, anger, and many other things in the context of the biodiversity crisis. And those emotions have also being historically very important for driving social change and bring people together in solidarity or motivating action. Um, but I think we wrote this paper as well because we felt that a lot of the writing, a lot of discussion around biodiversity was um, framed in that way and was sometimes being helpful and a negative in a way that was unhelpful and leading people to feel uh, demotivated. Um, we see increasing um, feelings of doom, um, which is also inaccurate and, and it's not motivating either. And negative headlines sadly do get uh, more clicks. And through the Conservation Optimism Network that uh, Sophia, you currently running and managing, we've got this network around the whole world and it becomes very clear that there are many conservationists and many people who um, see and feel opportunities for positive change as well and are finding ways to use that to connect and to inspire people. So I think uh, we felt that that deserved more prominence and wanted to help and provide a way for people to kind of connect to that uh, mindset as well. So finally, I think on a sort of personal note, many people who have been in conservation uh, for a short time or for a long time uh, will have found ways that they can sort of uh, remain motivated, remain committed to their work. Um, and I think it's about potentially a sense of hope, love, duty, community. So really it's about uh, finding ways for other people to connect to that, uh, those sources of power as well. Definitely. Um, I think that that was really nice, just the way that you touched on, um, I think some of these tensions that can emerge in positive communication sometimes, because it's almost like we don't want to have this sort of um skewed view of like no everything's totally fine right like as conservationists and I mean you know we all met when we were doing our PhDs in conservation and it's like pretty apparent that that there are things that are um that the world isn't exactly looking right now the way that we would like it to. Um gladness would you mind muting your uh microphone? Um but yeah, so essentially, I think that's a that's a really nice tension to to be exploring, and we, which we can also talk about uh, a bit more later on. Um, coming back to the paper, just sort of anchoring it on the paper, uh, there was a conceptual model that we put forward in terms of how different types of communication can um, inform the conservation movement and sort of motivate people or not. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and put that up now. And Emil, would you like to, to walk us through it? Yes, gladly. I'll just wait until I see it on my screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, 
So this is the figure from our paper. Um, it's a bit of a color bomb. Um, but I think this, I think I, I just touched on my previous answer on the kind of uh, journey that people go through as conservationists as well. And I think this figure is uh, a simplified, of, of course, version or display about that journey um, that conservationists and activists may be going through from the moment where they first learn and become aware of the ecological crisis through to be, being you know, uh, active and engaged in the issue um, over a longer period of their life. And it's not at all a linear progression. It's not at all something you kind of get to the end and, 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 and you've solved it, obviously. So we kind of wanted to make this circular and, and non-linear. But I think it nicely summarizes how we think positive communications can help people to navigate some of the challenges, the emotional challenges that are associated with being active in this crisis and in this space, as well as um, the risks, mental and emotional risks that can arise, personal, social risks as well. So uh, I could give a few examples. So for example, the first one, um, it's this, this idea that information about the threat, once you start to learn and become aware of, of these issues and the magnitude of these issues, um, that awareness is not sufficient to, to do something. So then you need to know what, how can I act? What can I act? Uh, um, what can I do in that context in order to, to um, make some kind of contribution to that, to the, to the problem or to solving that problem? Then if you don't have information or you don't have access to information about that, about things you can do, then you might become avoidant. You might simply um, feel completely powerless and, and avoid the issue altogether. So in that case, a positive communication approach could help people to find and connect to the things that they're actually able to do. Even if those contributions might, might be small, might be um, you know, in, in to each individual's uh, capacity and so on. But nevertheless, um, it can help people to feel like they can engage with something rather than that they need to turn away from it. Um, further down the line, you know, these, it's important to recognize that there's false solutions being promoted as well. And it's not at all the, the idea that um, these problems even necessarily have solutions. So it's not at all to try and say there's sort of simplistic solutions there, but nevertheless, I think a positive communication approach can help people to, to avoid feeling uh, disillusioned uh, with lack of progress. It can help people to engage with that progress in the long term by giving people access to the emotional and mental resources they need, senses of community, um, the warm glow that you get when you act in alignment with your own values and so on. And eventually those, I think, are resources that come from positive communication that can help people to navigate, to feel resilient and to sustain action in a healthy way um, into the long term. Nice, thank you for walking us through that. I'm going to stop sharing now, but we can come back to it later if anyone has any questions. Um, now I'd, I'd like to ask Will a question about something that you started touching on um, in, in the way that you were talking about the figure, Emil, which is actually the role of emotions. I think for me in the process of sort of co-writing this paper, that was one of the things that came up and I thought was so fascinating. And that I know that Will did a real kind of deep dive into the literature about. So, Will, um, from your review on the literature, it seems like different emotions can play a role in the biodiversity crisis. And it's not necessarily like one type of emotions are good and another type of emotions are bad. Um, but could you give us some examples of positive and negative emotions, how they impact each other and what an ideal balance might look like or a sort of balance that's empowering? Absolutely, yeah. So, so in the paper, we talk about emotional experiences and the, the effect that these have on our decision-making processes and, and cognition. And so we talk about negative emotions, shame, fear, anger, for example, and how these help us to respond to threats of a specific, uh, specific kind. Um, so anger, by way of example, that can reduce our, reduce our perceptions of risk. But we also talk about positive emotions, so pride, happiness, hope, for instance. 
And we talk about these by saying that these can help us to form social bonds, adopt new perspectives, and navigate complexity. But we draw on um, the work from, uh, I think it's, I've got his name. But uh, we basically are saying that these are not just simple levers that you can you can pull to bring about a predicted human um, re predicted response in terms of human behaviour. I mean, everyone is different, and people will respond to what they read, what they see, and what they hear in in different ways. Um, so, yeah, to answer the question, I think messages that draw on negative emotions can be an effective way of communicating urgency, for example. Um, and emotions such as anger and outrage can, can catalyze action. But what we found in our literature review, particularly when we were looking at the experience of climate change communicators, was that communication strategies that center around negative emotions can contribute to feelings of anxiety and, and, and disempowerment. Um, and so what we, what we try and say in this paper is that a range of, of communication approaches is needed. Um, there are a spectrum of different emotions, and I think these all can and, and, and should play a role in, in communicating on the biodiversity crisis. And, and we suggest that it's these messages that can trigger these positive emotions in audiences. Um, they're, they're perhaps an underutilized component of the communication toolkit. Um, I mean, I remember we spent a long time talking about how we categorize different emotions and negative and positive and experienced and and whether that was a, a constructive way to, to 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 think about emotions given that negative emotions um can contribute to action um and inspire um engagement um but i think just coming back to your previous question about why communication positive communication is underutilized I think fundamentally communicating on the biodiversity crisis is difficult. It's a subject that's complicated, it's relatively abstract. It means that we often have to talk about trade-offs that are involved. And so communicating complexity in a way that's digestible is challenging. And I think trying to weave in messages and narratives that try and motivate action on top of that adds to that challenge. And um, yeah, I think possibly it is easier to issue threats and, 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 and warnings as an alternative. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that obviously emotions are incredibly complicated and, and nothing like levers that we can be pulling. And obviously we're all experiencing a lot of different emotions at a time as well, right? Like it's possible to hold multiple emotions simultaneously um, to be sort of disillusioned with um, the way that the world currently is and at the same time be satisfied with the work that you're doing as a conservationist or have hope for the future or feel happy to be working with people who um, you know you connect with um, so so yeah I think that's important to to recognize and just for anyone who's interested in this point a bit further also um, we did in the with the good natured podcast through conservation optimism we did an interview with a psychologist called Caroline Hickman about eco-anxiety, which was a really, really wonderful conversation because it talks a little bit about how to process these emotions um, and what to actually kind of do with them and, and how to still be able to kind of move forward. So I, if anyone else who's curious about this topic and wants to delve into it further, definitely check that out. Um, Emil, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I could add um, <clears throat> um, just a, I, I like what you say about, you know, we're holding, we're all holding multiple emotions and it's not about saying um, we shouldn't feel those negative emotions and we should focus only on the positive. Um, at the same time, I think there's two sort of aspects of the biodiversity crisis that are, that are really important and in, and for which reasons positive emotions are, are particularly important. And I think we tried to draw that out in the paper as well. So the first one is that it's, it's such a complex problem, right? So it's, it requires us to be, we need creativity, we need to cooperate. And positive emotions, positive emotional states can help people to do that. And the second thing is that it's not something that we're going to solve overnight. It's something we'll be working on 
for the rest of our lives and our children's lives and, and so on and so on. And so we cannot live in a, in a state of anger for 50 years or we'll all die of heart attacks. <laughs> I think so part of the, what positive emotion and positive emotional experiences do as well is give you the resources and, and, and the resilience. And a lot of the literature which looks at what kind of messaging is best, negative framings, positive framings, it's all kind of lab based. So they look at a message and then they measure how people respond the same day. But if we think about it in this context where it's almost like an infinite problem, navigate forever without a clear path forward. I think and that's a very good argument for me that we should have a positivity. We should remain open-minded, curious, and so on. Yeah, I think that's very true. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, I guess that gives like a bit of the sort of literature background of the paper and um, some of what we, uh, yeah, sort of wanted to talk through. Um, I think the the other part of the paper was looking at, you know, now that we know that <clears throat> communication can bring these sort of different ways of, um, it can bring these different benefits, uh, how do we actually go about doing it? Um, and how, what kind of tips or advice or elements can we, can we suggest? And so this part of the paper, we really based on the positive communication toolkit and a workshop that we did with Ralph Underhill a couple of years ago. Um, and I'll just walk through a few of the sort of elements and, um, and tips that we give there before we open up to questions. So a few of the elements of positive communication in practice. Um, first of all, having a clear objective, very important. Um, trying to think through what it is that you want to achieve with a particular communication. Uh, having a specific audience in mind. So making sure that you have a picture of who it is that you want to reach or like the groups of people that, that you really want to get this message. Um, also having in mind some desired outcomes or objectives, and those are slightly different. So your objectives are looking at your goals or your visions, whereas the outcomes are maybe kind of considering what, what would that look like in practice, right? Like what, what would be kind of the evidence almost that, that you'd gotten there? Uh, and then finally, having appropriate measures of success. So having some sort of metric that can allow you to track whether you actually achieved what you wanted to. Um, and moving on from that, then we also had some tips that we put forward for people to consider when they're crafting a communication, uh, sort of when they're talking about conservation and want to do it in a positive way. Um, our first tip was to consider the associations that are already in people's heads. So according to the words or images that you're using, what do you imagine that people already associate with that? And how will you work with that to make sure that your message gets put across in the way that you want and that people, that the concepts are going to land in the way that you expect. Um, second of all, we recommend really being very clear about what's happening to whom and why. So this really gets to the sort of clear description of the issue point around of the positive communication definition, where we really kind of recommend not using the passive voice. And as, as scientists, it can be tempting to just kind of like completely remove uh, yourself and, and sort of agency from the equation. But it is really helpful to be very clear about um, sort of the, the chain of causality as much as possible. Um, third of all, we recommend balancing threats with positive solutions. So this is really getting to the point of um, acknowledging reality and acknowledging the difficulties and acknowledging sort of the situation that we're in, but at the same time, providing some sort of pathway forward, right? So saying if, if there are any solutions that have been put forward, if there are any positive actions that people can take, making sure that you highlight that. So as not to kind of just leave your audience in the sort of despondency um, spiral. That's not, a, that's not a technical definition, but um, yeah, you kind of just, it's like acknowledging the threats, but then also giving something to move forward with and balancing out with something positive. Our fourth tip was avoiding typecasting. So we don't want to be um, 
leaning on stereotypes in the way that we communicate about conservation. We don't want to oversimplify. Um, so one of the examples here would be around the use of the word poachers or something like that. And that also sort of gets to the associations in people's heads. It's really sort of not necessarily attributing a negative intention to anyone, um, but sort of being a bit more open and aware of what might be going on for different groups at different times. And then our fifth point is to try and be open about failure as a learning experience. And the fact that that can, it's not just about sort of, oh, we did this and everything's amazing and now everything's all right and it's going to be great forever. It's rather like no, no success or it's ever unqualified, like no success ever happens, well, very few successes without having some challenges along the way. And actually sharing those can be a really positive experience because it can allow us all to make more progress. Um, and it can also help people to not feel so alone when things aren't necessarily going well, you're not exactly sure what's going wrong with your project. Um, so it can really sort of help us all to collaborate and learn within conservation. And that's quite an important element of the positive communication um, framework, I guess, or like principles. Um, yeah, and just to give you a very clear grounded example of what I'm talking about, I think it would be great if Emil could now walk through the second figure in our paper where he applied these principles uh, to actually his case study from his PhD. So I'll just bring that up on the screen now and then Emil, if you wouldn't mind walking us through it. Sure. Okay, so uh, as you can see on the screen, you know, we have these two examples that we used in our paper and they're very different. Um, but the one on the left is, is the one which uh, comes from my PhD work. So, um, and within that, within each example, we also kind of draw out the, how a positive communication thing might look and how you might follow our uh, tips for two different audiences. And so on the left, we have this sort of broader audience, which is the, to actually achieve a policy change for regulation of poisoning, which was identified as one of the kind of strategies that, that could be implemented. But I'm gonna focus on the, the, this part on the right, which is actually at the field level, on the ground level, the work we did with the uh, residents of the areas where the poisoning was happening. Um, as that's what I focused on in my PhD. So just to give a kind of background to the issue, um, this is back in about 2016, 2017, uh, local conservationists and um, officials were sort of finding that um, wildlife was being poisoned. So I don't know if you can actually see me right now, but I've got in my background the beautiful landscape in the north of Cambodia. Right now in this picture, it's, it's very wet. But in the dry season, it gets very dry and there's only a few water sources remaining. And they were finding that there were sort of dead animals all around some of these water sources um, and the pesticides had been deposited there. And this was a bit of a mystery. But through um, kind of engaged field work and, and, and in-depth field work with several villages, several communities there, we learned that the main sort of reason or the main um, cause of this was young men in, who, who were living in that area using pesticides as a way to hunt wildlife. Um, and it's, you know, actually it makes sense. It's a very effective method. You can catch a lot of animals. Um, and people kind of, they kind of thought that uh, if you took out the, the insides of the animal, or drain the blood, then you'd be okay. Uh, it, the, the poison wouldn't affect you too much. And that also comes from an experience they had with, with traditional pesticides that come from trees and so on, uh, not pesticide, poison, sorry, that come from trees, which, are, which have been historically used to hunt wildlife as in many other places in the world. But obviously this, this practice now with these modern chemical agrochemicals is affecting um, wildlife, but also the safety and the health of other residents. They were losing access to drinking water. Um, they were having dogs, even cows killed in this way. 
And through engaging in discussions with these communities, it became clear that many people were unhappy with the situation. But it was a sensitive issue and people were nervous about engaging uh, in conflict on the issue. Um, they were worried about the risk of that escalating. Um, and moreover, it was hard to know, you know exactly who was doing that because um, given the sensitivity, it was often done in, in a kind of secrecy. So with my colleagues at WCS, we engaged um, people within these communities in a kind of process where we designed uh, strategies to try and um, address this issue. And how could we, what stories could we tell, what messages could we use, what information did we need to provide in order to try and, and, and reduce this kind of issue. And I think the, the, the direction we came to was quite a positive approach. Um, and I think the thing that best illustrates this is, is the kind of participatory filmmaking approach we use. So we actually went to one village and worked with uh, young kids and others in the village to, to create a film and tell a story about this issue and about the poisoning and displayed this film in other villages as part of a broader event where we also had you know, doctors talking about the health risks and so on. Um, and in this film, we had we made space to, sh to show the sort of negative impacts of poisoning, the risks for people's health and for people's fears, anxieties, and the anger that might come with that. But the film also showed uh, how people could eventually then come together with their neighbors, with their relatives, to talk about the issue, to engage with each other in a constructive way, and to eventually help protect the health of their community, which is the objective, right? The objective is not to um, arrest or punish young men. The, the objective is to ensure that the health and, and uh, safety of the community is safeguarded. Um, so our message is very much focused on um, uh, you know, a variety of things, but I think quite positive. So, Rather than saying poisoning is dangerous to your health and it's illegal, you could be punished. Our message was very much, let's work together to keep the community safe from pesticide contamination. And we also um, developed a kind of hotline so people could report poisoning and then there would be a, a response and a cleanup in, in that case. Um, I will just, you know, full disclosure, I'll admit it's very difficult from a scientific perspective to know exactly how much impact these interventions had. Um, poisoning was already uh, quite small scale, uh, not, not a large sort of data set you could gather there. Uh, There's only a small number of villages where this was implemented. But using surveys and using uh, and through discussions and over several years with uh, people in those communities that I now uh, know quite well, there was an impression that this uh, story and this had helped to shift people's mindsets and that excuse me, and that poisoning had become much less prevalent. I also think our approach is important because it was, um, not only did it reduce poisoning potentially, but it also avoided um, some of the risks that could have come with a more, uh, let's say, negative approach. So um, it, we could have um, gone hard against those young men and they were already quite vulnerable in many ways, and that would have probably had uh, negative impacts on their prospects and on their lives. Uh, but also it avoided the risks of, of uh, provoking and instigating conflict in these communities, which are small knit, closely knit communities. Um, so that's the example. Um, there are, I think there are many others that we didn't cover in the paper, and maybe we can discuss uh, later as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that, Emil. I think it's really helpful to have something that's that's grounded and that also just sort of puts across the fact that when it comes to positive communication, a lot of it can be about really sort of knowing exactly what it is that you want to get across, knowing the context and really sort of understanding it, and then also doing your best to steer away from these sort of simplistic narratives that are, that can be quite damaging. Uh, so yeah, that was that was really great. Um, just one last question for you before we then open up, because I can see in the chat that we do have um, several questions that are coming. Um, I really liked this point that you brought up a little bit earlier, Emil, around the long-term nature of what we're doing. And the fact that uh, 
conservation isn't really a sort of one and done field. So what exactly is it that positive communication brings given that context and given the fact that it seems like we're kind of in this for the longer haul? Okay, uh, great. Um, so a few things, I think the first is, um, and these are, these are things that have all been um, fairly well documented and studied uh, scientifically as well by psychologists and by sociologists. Um, the first thing is that um, positive emotions, positive communications can help people to uh, feel open. So open to other people's perspectives, open-minded, curious, and help people to connect. So I think um, it's something that we need. Uh, inevitably, uh, conflict is also a part of social change, but I think there's also an important role for cooperation and uh, collective action. Um, and so that's one thing that positive communications can help people to do. The second thing is that they build mental and emotional resources. So what's sometimes called resilience. Um, so that's very important, I think, because, uh, because of this long-term nature. So um, other sort of anger, sadness, these things um, can create stress. They can, um, they're not sustainable. Whereas feeling positive can help you to sustain yourself. You know, we all, um, have, when, we, when we're stressed at work, we all take a break, we spend time with family. We do things that make us feel good as well. And I think uh, positive, and those are important for us to be able to go back to work and to do the things that we do day in, day out. And similarly, um, it's important to celebrate the successes that you have, right? There's also things that enable you to keep going. So I think um, that's one thing where uh, positive communications can play an important role is in um, enabling people to keep going in the long, into the long term um, and avoiding things like burnout. And the third and final thing, and I think it's kind of connected to the first one, but it's this idea of creativity. So the complexity of that, of the issue that we're facing, um, the fact that um, it's, a, it's a wicked problem. Sometimes people say there are conflicting viewpoints. Um, there may not be a single right way and a, and a wrong way. It depends on your perspective as well. But positivity can help you feel, can help you think more creatively. It can help you to, um, again, uh, connected to the first point, look at things from different perspectives. And I think that's something that we also really need um, in, this, in this context. Completely agree with all of that. Um, just before we open up to audience questions, was there anything that either of you wanted to say? Yeah, just to reiterate um, what Emil just said there, I think it is very important to focus on the success stories in conservation because they are there when you look for them and to focus on the small wins as well. Um, and I think the other thing that's important to mention at this point is when we were thinking about um, the elements that are needed to help form uh, an effective message, but then also the tips that we outlined in the paper, we put these forward um, to complement other lessons that have been put forward by other authors in recent years. Um, and so there are some great papers that have come out which have looked at um, how to uh, construct effective biodiversity conservation message framing, for example. So we were really thinking about the subject, um, looking at other resources that have come, come out in recent years. Absolutely. Um, I think it's wonderful to see that a lot of more work is kind of coming out and that we can build on it and uh, again just kind of collaborate and really try to make sure that um, we have a balance in the way that we're talking about conservation and managing to motivate people at the same time as we're being realistic and sort of acknowledging the challenges that we have. With that let's open up to some questions from the audience. Um, shall we first of all do if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask out loud please do. Go ahead, Charlie. Hi, thanks for this. And this is really, really interesting and, and insightful. So thanks for making for making it available. Um, I'm really interested in, in the messenger effect and 
the role of our behavior as messengers and how our individual behavior reinforces or, or, or has the opposite effect on um, the message we're giving. And there's, there's increasing work about this in social psychology, and we see it a lot in, um, in climate change activism. So I realize I realize um, you know, much of this talk was was about communicating to specific communities um, and about engaging specific behaviors. Um, but I think you know these principles of, of of positive communication apply also really broadly in how we communicate about biodiversity more broadly. Um, and I just wondered how you feel about about the necessity of. Um, I don't know, walking the walk as well as talking the talk and, you know, showing leadership in, in, in our behavior. So in the context of warning type of messaging, we hear a lot that, um, you know, scientists are saying it's a planetary emergency. It's a biodiversity crisis. It, it's it's a, a climate emergency. And yet we're just carrying on with our own lives. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis as if nothing has changed for the most part, which gives this impression that actually it can't be as bad as all that if we're not doing more about it. Now, I wonder if if we need to do more as conservationists to make, um, with positive messaging too, you know, we, we encourage the general public to do things that we don't necessarily do ourselves. So when people say, what can we do for biodiversity? You know, we don't want to just leave it to professional conservationists. I want to support biodiversity too. So we say things like, okay, well, you know, adopt a plant-based diet and be careful with the fishery and, you, you know, um, and get involved in campaigning and activism and, and try and put political pressure on. And yet we don't, we often don't do these ourselves as individuals. Um, I, I I wonder, and I was, I was sorry, I am waffling on, but I, I just came to this because um, Will's very first answer to the very first question, you said, what is positive communication? And, and Will said, it's words, sounds and images that, you know, meet these criteria. But but is it not more than words, sounds and images? Do we not have to walk the walk to? Will, do you want to take that question? Or Emil, either. Yeah, I mean. Not sure. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think it is. It does move beyond. We've got to move beyond the written word. It is about images. It's about sounds. But as you say, I think I think it is about uh, more than that. Uh, and yeah, I, I, we do have to walk the walk as well. I think it's all well and good writing about it, but you've got to back that up. Um, and I think it's a hard question to answer. I think if we're all being honest, I, you know, we could probably say, well, I could be doing that better and I should be making these changes, but we don't because it's inconvenient or it's expensive or it's whatever. So I suppose it's a subject that um, goes beyond the paper um, to an extent, but I think what we thought about when we were writing this paper is we, we focus much a lot on on emotions as part of this paper but we see this as fitting into just one pillar of a broader positive communication framework um and and i think emotions is just one strand of that and i think it's going it, when yeah i think there's there's a paper in that essentially Yeah, I guess I could just add that I also really agree. And Charlie, your, you know, thanks for being here. First of all, it's, it's um, great to meet you. I'm not sure if we've met before, but I follow you and everything you write and do and say and do indeed the example that you set. And I think and I find that uh, very inspiring. So thank you for that as well. Um, in the in that kind of context of what does it look like to kind of embody or set the example of change of the radical change that's needed and um to some in some ways i, I suppose um there's also narratives around sacrifice there and but also we see uh you know people like greta thunberg uh, taking the train everywhere and having a good time as well on the way um and i think part of that is to say look this is actually these are things that i do that enrich my life as well uh, and that make life better and allow me to connect to the world and connect to the people around me and uh, not be consuming, consuming. And so I think there's also a positive story to tell there in a way. Um, 
So yeah, just two thoughts, two cents there. Completely. I mean, such an interesting question. And I think a topic where, yeah, this paper was was sort of looking more at these targeted and specific communications, but I think it's something that we all experience as conservationists and as um, people in the sphere is just like this sense of like, am I being a hypocrite, you know, like at, at given moments or sort of wanting, knowing that communication does take so many forms and that in a lot of cases, it won't necessarily be a formalized message that you've really thought through. It might be something that one of your friends asks you at dinner, right? Or a kind of conversations that happen a lot more organically or just people watching you and seeing seeing what it is that you do and, and taking you as an example. And so I do think it's a really important point around more widely uh, sort of how do we how do we balance these elements? Um, anyone else who, who wanted to ask a question, we can also go to the chat uh, if people don't want to say them out loud. Yeah, I'm loving a lot of the comments here. Yeah, I'm really looking nice. at the comments as well. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, yeah, no, some really good points um, just around the, the experience and the emotional consequences of being um, being conservationists. Um, and also, I, so Rebecca in the chat was just talking about uh, beating ourselves up for not doing the right behavior. And I think that that can also be quite a toxic emotional cycle that we can get into. So I don't know, it's almost like needing positive communication with ourselves um and not burning ourselves out as well by getting into these sort of negative feedback loops in the mm -hmm. ways that we talk to each other but in ourselves but that's that's beyond my wheelhouse I'm not a psychologist we kind of need we need someone else who can maybe talk to those points a bit more um I think it relates to our the first figure we showed as well so in a way it's like somebody like like maybe Charlie if I can use you as an example you know somehow it, you found a way and it would be very interesting to hear you talk about how you you find the way to keep motivated and to keep doing what you do but then the, you could go into that sort of negative loop but also that what's the positive loop right what's the way in which you feel okay I'm actually doing the right thing I feel I'm on the right path um it's 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 giving me something positive as well that that is keeping me going and I think that's just something that Maybe it's talked about less in some ways. Yeah. Um, there is a really lovely question in the chat here that I think might be interesting to chat through, which is from Francis Asamoah. And it's how do you use the energy from negative emotions in communication? How do you sort of make negative energy a good thing? So I definitely have a couple of thoughts on that, but want to open it up to you two first. I think, Sophia, why don't you go ahead? I'm curious. Oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think this this question really got to me just because I think it's, it's something we've been talking about, this balance between the positive and the negative, right? And the kind of the acknowledgement of the difficulty, which almost gives power to the positive side of it and to the hope of it, right? Like it sort of a, it gives us something to channel um, and it gives us a purpose. Um, and I think actually this i this is something that i've seen most has actually like struck me most and something that i've done which isn't this paper which is that i do improvised comedy and i and theater and i've done a i've put together a show which is about conservation and about a community that's sort of trying to save an endangered species and at first and i've just realized the power of balancing both difficulty and sort of like more somber moments with laughter because like you just don't get that many laughs if you're constantly staying on this like upbeat track. And actually a lot of times, like it's kind of dipping into like the harder emotions of it and the, the moments that are like more complex, more difficult and maybe sad. And then after that is when you always get the biggest laughs and you always get like the most kind of engagement. And so it's almost like being able to vacillate between those two is actually what can be incredibly powerful. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you both think. Yeah, I think that really speaks to the complexity of, of our emotional experience, right? And it's, again, it's not 
this is an emotion and you trigger it and that's the emotion you feel. But uh, yeah, through art, as Charlie is mentioning in the comment as well, it's this com the, allows the complexity of your emotional experience. And they often come as two sides of a coin almost. And I think that's just, which here we're really just trying to sort of bring the other side as well. Um, so that's all I, I want to say really. Well, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah, just to say it, it's D Daniel Chapman is who talks about emotions not being these simple levers that we that we can pull and, and, and use. Um, and, um, you know, I think to, to, to try and answer the question, I think negative negative emotions can be used in productive ways. And I think they can. I think, you know, anger can be a good thing. I think it's important that we feel worried about things. And I think it's important that we express that. But I think if we are to do that over a long period of time, um, it's it's going to become tiring and people are, are drawn to positive stories. So as Emil said, what we have tried to do in this paper is to say that a balance is needed. These negative, negative emotions are important, but we have these positive emotional experiences as well that we perhaps should be drawing on because perhaps they are being underutilized as a, as a tool for communications. Absolutely. And just to go back quickly to that podcast episode with Caroline Hickman, who is a psychologist, uh, she talked about um, having one hand behind, tied behind your back, like using that image of when you're just trying to repress negative emotion. And so how important it is to actually be acknowledging and processing this stuff as it comes up, because it also makes room for the positivity and it also allows you to move forward um, and to have that catharsis. Uh, Next question from Claire Adler. How do we communicate the need for systems change without making individuals feel powerless or insignificant? Did this question inform any of the specific campaigns you discussed? Okay, so I think um, often when, when people talk about system change, it's kind of in the abstract, it's the system or something like that. And I think several of the of the points that we make here is that we want to make communications concrete that they talk about specific actions by specific actors um, and so i think that's systems in the end are made up of people and it's how are you located within the systems what are the opportunities for you to act within that context um, in the context of the communication campaign i don't know maybe this is uh, more suited to the fisheries example well as well um what do you think yeah i think um it is about scale i think uh it's about thinking about what can be done on an individual level because our individual actions feed into um broader society um it's a, yeah it's a good question um I, yeah what in the paper, we tried to complement the example of wildlife poisoning with by looking at um, fishing subsidies and conversations, international conversation on that subject has progressed since the paper has come out. Um, but we try and look at that case study through the lens of our, our tips that we put forward um, in the paper. So we um, when we're trying when we think about, for example, um, balancing threats with positive actions or solutions, you know, what we, you can talk about that. You could, you could, you could frame one message by saying, well, you know, fishing subsidies uh, drive over fishing, they um, risk jeopardizing the livelihoods of fishers. But actually, if we were to reinvest those subsidies, um, you know, that could bring about benefits, not just for fish stocks for, um, but, 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 but for people who are involved um in along the supply chain in in in, in fisheries um so yeah we also try to avoid typecasting as well so we're thinking well you know who are the nations that are putting out all these subsidies you know there are some countries that are um 
massive massively subsidizing their international fishing fleet but actually if you look at it a lot of countries are doing it so we're just trying to balance it i think um but yeah it's a good question it is a very good question um sorry i'm just going to i'm, I'm aware of the time uh and i and i do think that it's a great question and one that you know, is is so difficult and is really at the heart of so many of these discussions. Like we, I do think we could talk about it forever and I wish we could. Um, but yeah, just before we wrap up, um, since we only have a couple of minutes left before we're all going to have to go, um, I just wanted to thank our amazing panelists, uh, Dr. Emile DeLang and William Sharkey. I also wanted to acknowledge our other co-authors from the paper. So Julia Minier, Ralph Underhill, and EJ Milner Gulland uh, for the work that they put into the paper as well. Um, I see that in the chat, Rashu has put a feedback form. We would so appreciate it if you could fill it out and just let us know what you thought of the webinar, any um, ways that we can improve for the future, that would be really great. Um, and yeah, feel free to, well, in terms of conservation optimism, you can follow our work online on social media um i'm not the i'm not sure of the best ways to get in touch with with emil and will but we can put any information that they're happy for us we can share any information that we're happy that they're happy for us to share um if you get in touch with us um and yeah thank you so much everybody and um i hope you have a great rest of your wednesdays thank you thank you Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. That was great. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.